Eh, tenemos la oportunidad de presentar ahora a George Van der Bort. George Van der Bort es eh, máster en ciencias, en metalurgia y ciencia de los materiales de la Universidad de Lehigh. George recibió su bachiller en ciencias e ingeniería metalúrgica del Instituto de Tecnología de Drexel y recibió su premio de exalumno distinguido en el año 2005. George es miembro de la Sociedad Americana de Ensayos de Materiales, la conocemos acá como ASTM. Es miembro de la Sociedad Americana para Metales, la conocemos también acá como ASM. Eh, es eh, preciso recordar que, que George tiene una larga historia trabajando en lo que, temas de análisis de falla y ha sido un, eh, una persona que ha contribuido eh, de manera sustancial en eh, aquellos textos que, que, que nos brinda la ASM, conocidos como handbooks, en, sobre todo en los volúmenes relacionados a metalografía y microestructuras. También ha tenido aportes importantes en lo que respecta a fractografía, análisis de falla y caracterización de materiales. Eh, demos la bienvenida con un fuerte aplauso a George Van der Bort. Uh, There's no additive manufacturing in here, no welding te uh, technology per se, but just using the microscopes to study welds as well as the human eye when macrostructures. Uh, that's my topic. And uh, you, you'll see that uh, I personally am an advocate of using color etching techniques in microscopy because they are much more powerful than black and white etchants. And for steels, yes, there is life beyond nitol. Nitol is not always the best etch. In fact, most of the time it's not. So, we're going to start here. Uh, Want to understand the welding process and it's how it affects structure. And of course, the microstructure can affect service life and performance. So we have fusion welding processes, as you've heard uh, today. Shielded metal arc, submerged arc, gas metal arc, gas tungsten arc, plasma arc, electro slag, electro gas, oxy fuel gas, electron beam, laser beam, stud welding, percussion, thermite. We've got resistance welding techniques. These are among the oldest. Spot, seam, projection, flash, and solid state welding processes, which are very old, go back uh, into antiquity with forge welding and deformation, diffusion bonding, explosive bonding, friction, friction stir, ultrasonic, upset welding. And of course, we've got brazing technologies as well, using a furnace, a torch, or induction. Now here's a, a basic schematic showing the macrostructure of uh, typical weld joints in plate. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this terminology. I don't think I really need to go into too much detail on that. Oh, uh, but you can see the uh, the uh, weld. Uh, I found the, the pointer. Uh, here's our weld bead and our melted area on either side, and the heat affected zone, and then the base metal out here. And uh, here's an angular weld. And uh, you can see the penetration is not very deep in either of those plates, which can cause problems. And this is a schematic showing the relationship of the welding temperatures to the iron carbon phase diagram. And of course, uh, our alloys are much more complicated than pure iron and carbon. <laughs> But uh, you, you can see that we get temperatures well up into the austenitic region and uh, so forth. And we won't dwell too much on that because we got other things we got to talk about. The green button is for sign. This one? Green button. Yeah, this one. What is this one? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Oh. Okay. And you saw schematics like this already today. The, uh, 
our, oops. Our uh, weld joint here, uh, the, uh, oop, hmm, where's the one for the, 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 the uh, no, I want the one for the, the spot. I got my own here for uh, pointing at things, but it won't show up on here. Anyway, uh, here's a classic example of uh, the uh, hmm. I can't get the thing to point on the screen. There we go. Here's our weld bead and the weld direction. And we're going to look at this region right in here. Uh, this is the weld metal, the, the fusion line, the heat affected zone, and the base metal. And these are important parameters. Uh, there are a great deal of terminology that's used with respect to defects in welds. And you can see some of them will have multiple names like face crack and longitudinal crack and weld metal crack and so forth. And there, but it's important that when you're discussing uh, failures of welds in a report or if you're doing things uh, with uh, a failure study, maybe court case, it's important that you uh, use the right terminology. Now, I'm going to look at a few imperfections in welds. And here is a, a weld in a tube and uh, standard macro etch with 10% nitric in water. And uh, you can see up here is the base metal and base metal here. You can see we've got a big weld nugget here. We've got another here, another here, another here. And there's a crack right here at the ID and one at the OD. And of course, those are highly undesirable in a product going into service. And uh, there, there was also a uh, right here. I didn't mention it, but uh, oh, just, come on. But right here, you can see some uh, slag or something in this uh, area that had no weld penetration, but some kind of foreign material that you'd have to do maybe microprobe analysis or dig some out and do x-ray diffraction to find out what it is. Um, here's a, a, an interesting weld. This uh, picture uh, was given to me by uh, Dr. Dolby at the Welding Institute in the UK. It's a macrostructure of a hydrogen-induced root crack in the heat effect zone. This is the alloy composition, 0.2 carbon, 1.43 manganese, 0.15 silicon, and niobium addition. And you can see there's very little weld penetration into the base metal here, which is not good. And there's this big gap here, which is also not a very good thing to have. And, but of course, we have this crack here as well. And there's a crack on the bottom there. Here's a RQC90 steel plate that was welded with a high hydrogen electrode deliberately to see what would happen. This is an in-plant test specimen, which is a mechanical test to see the effect of uh, the welding process on the service. The implant test specimen was loaded to 193 megapascals, which is 28 KSI, during the weld solidification to test the sensitivity of the alloy to hydrogen-induced cracking. And you can see there's a crack here. Here's the fracture surface. It's predominantly uh, intergranular. This etch was nitol. And you can see there's cracks here, crack over here. And this is part of the fracture surface up here. And of course, uh, that's not a good performance. Now, there's another uh, classic failure problem in the literature. And I've actually in, been involved in a couple of these cases uh, called lamellar tearing. And this is a, a schematic of the process. Um, we have elastic stress concentration at the tips of this crack and, uh, and inclusions. These are, uh, uh, sometimes these follow sulfide inclusion stringers, but uh, this, and this is an inclusion here. 
uh, or sulfides, and we've got high stress at the tips, and then the, the, the uh, starts cracking and linking together, and eventually the, the whole piece falls apart. And uh, here's an example uh, of, of also from uh, Dr. Dolby at the Welding Institute of, of a heat-affected zone lamellar tearing here and a carbon manganese corner joint. And you can see the, the, the fracture down here. The etch, macro etching is bringing up some segregation. You can even see inclusion stringers in here uh, carefully. And then we've got the longitudinal direction this way over here, the longitudinal direction this way. And there's not a great deal of weld penetration over here, but uh, the cracking is on the left side. Here's another example. And uh, this actually came from a failure of a structure down in Florida. Uh, a building was being created, and uh, you can see there's very little penetration here and down here. And uh, this is a typical design problem. And uh, this building uh, had a lot of tears like this. You can see we've got huge weld uh, joints that are multi-pass on each side, but very little penetration uh, here and here. And this is the longitudinal direction. And the stresses are, and it had an excessively high sulfur content in the steel. It was legal by the standard, less than 0.045% sulfur, but it wasn't a lot less than that. Uh, and if you're doing this kind of welding process, uh, you, you really need to have much lower sulfur than that. But the poor penetration is a serious problem. Uh, here's a heat, uh, heat hot tear in the heat affected zone of a metal inert gas welded HY80 plate steel, uh, high strength plate steel etched with nitol. And you can see the, the cracks, they're in grain boundaries. Uh, this is a st stress relief cracking in uh, a test developed at Lehigh University called the Lehigh Restraint Test in the literature. Um, I worked at Bethlehem Steel for 16 and a half years, started in the Bethlehem plant, and then uh, after s uh, about six years, I was in Homer Research Lab for the next 10. And I did my graduate school work at Lehigh University, and uh, they had, a, at that time, some really good metallurgists there. Um, that was when George Krauss was still teaching at Lehigh University. And around 1974, he moved out to Colorado School of Mines and is now emeritus and uh, uh, o over 80. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, and there were quite a few people doing welding work there. Alan Pence was another one, uh, Bob Stout. So, some of you probably know these, these names. Um, you can see these are hardness indents right here, but uh, this is the crack. And uh, over here at 200x, you can see uh, more details of the crack o over on this side. And it has a, a high degree of intergranular fracture. Uh, but that's a test that's set up to detect uh, how the, the, the stress involved in the, the weld solidification can cause failures. And obviously, this one failed. Let's look at some macrostructures next. Uh, that is not a steel sample. <laughs> That's a, a brass. Ooh. I don't know what made that noise, but I think it was me touching my, the, the uh, unit in my pocket with my arm. Um, these are three gas metal arc welds in structural steel with a heat input of 45 kilojoules per inch. And the atmosphere is 100% CO2 here. And then this one is argon with 25% CO2. This is argon with 2% CO2, or excuse me, O2. And uh, I've etched this with 10% nitric in water as a, a mac good macro etch. And you can see how the uh, penetration of the weld into the base metal has been altered by the uh, gas uh, content that was being used. And here's a, a similar example. Uh, this is a structural steel. 
we're doing submerged arc welds, but the heat input is varying from 90 kilojoules per inch to 60 to 30. And of course, the more heat you put in, the bigger the weld is and the, the higher it sticks up. And if you're not careful, you can get some stress concentrators at the edge due to the geometric uh, uh, angle there. And that can cause you some problems in service. Uh, this is an aerial view, so to speak, of uh, MIG metal inert gas fusion welds in ASTM A517 steel. We're using three different heat inputs, and obviously this is the highest. Here's the end of the, of the weld, and here's the intermediate, and here's the lowest. And when we look at these in cross-section, and this unfortunately had a little debris on the, on the uh, sample when it was photographed, but you can see the patterns that are created. The heat affected zone here is much deeper. The weld is much larger. There's this middle deeper penetration. This has a very deep penetration right here. And it looks like there's some cracks right in here. And this one is much smaller. But again, that angle there is a little bit steep, which is not a good thing. Uh, here's some additional sh shots of this uh, A36 structural steel on the left. A517 on the right, uh, uh, different, uh, two different welds here, uh, and you can see the pattern here of the penetration of the weld. There's not a lot of depth of penetration below this surface over here, but there's good depth of penetration here. The heat affected zone is less pronounced here than it is over here. A36 is just garden variety like 1020 carbon steel, and it, it was an alloy that was created back, I think, in the 1920s, or maybe even a little earlier. Been around forever. And 517 is a more modern, uh, higher strength structural steel. And here's uh, examples of uh, the mic uh, hardness on these uh, samples. On the left, we're using the Rockwell B scale, and on the right, the Rockwell C scale. And these slides were made before we used to, we're now calling them officially HRB and HRC in the ASTM literature. But these pictures are, are fairly old. And you can see the hardness value going to 72 here in the base metal, 89 in the weld metal here. And you can see right here it's 77, and then 84, and 88, and 91. So there's an increase in hardness as we're going across. And over here, of course, this is higher strength material. We're in the Rockwell C scale. Uh, the Rockwell B scale begins below 20 Rockwell C. And uh, over here, we're at 26 and a half. Over here, we're at 27 Rockwell C in the base metal. And of course, it's going up to 26 or 27 right near the fusion line. And the weld metal itself is below the Rockwell C scale right there. 16s. That's technically not a valid number, but it gives you an easy comparison uh, to the other data. And you can look at these microstructurally, if you will. Uh, here's the A36 MIG weld that you saw earlier. Here's our weld metal up here, the fusion line, the heat affected zone, and down here is the base metal. Here's the original base metal, longitudinal plane. This is the beginning of the heat affected zone. And what you're seeing is the perlite that's in the base metal is starting to go into uh, dis dissolution and then re-precipitate. And, and it's not a lamellar structure anymore. And uh, over here, we're deeper in the heat affected zone. So the temperature one was high enough to, put, to create austenite. And then on cooling, it's producing very, for very fine perlite. And over here, we're even uh, we're in the base of the of the nugget, and you can see very coarse grains here. Uh, this is a hardness is 227 vickers. Over here, it's 237 vickers. And then this is the weld metal itself. So the microstructures vary uh, quite a bit as you because of the heat going into the um, weld metal and the base metal and so forth, and then the transformation on cooling. Let's look at some weld microstructures. Um, here is uh, an etch of 10006 carbon steel uh, welded sample. The weld metal is over here. This is the heat affected zone. Here's the base metal. 
Now, when you look at it etched with Clem's reagent, you can't see the perlite that's in here, but you're seeing the ferrite grains beautifully. Because Clem's is, a ver is the most powerful colorer of ferrite in steels. No etch is as, is as powerful. And you notice in this zone over here, when you look at it in color, you can see columnar grains there. And that area was in the two-phase region of ferrite and austenite. And when, since it's columnar, that tells me that this steel was not aluminum killed. Because if it was aluminum killed, it would have stayed more equiaxed. But when it's columnar and it's in, or non-aluminum killed, you're in two-phase region, you're going to see columnar grains. And uh, here's uh, at the edge of the weld, and this, or excuse me, this is the edge of the weld. This is the edge of the base metal. Here's the base metal in better view over here. This is only 50x. These are both 50x. But I, I hope that shows you some of the power of color etching. And here are higher mag views of uh, 500x. This is the weld metal, the heat affected zone. You can see the perlite patches are degenerate perlite because the, the, the perlite started going into solution, then it, on cooling it precipitates out. And it's no longer lamellar. And in the base metal here, you can see we have a little bit of perlite. They're very small patches. We've got inclusions in here too. And um, it, uh, it's, it's important to look at your uh, material that you're welding um, with a microscope to see what you got, uh, especially with test specimens that are designed for you to be able to look at them afterwards. A lot of times people in welding something will do a couple coupons in, in the process that, they, that they're going to examine. Or later on, if there's a failure, people are going to examine them. And here's uh, two of these areas using Clem's number one, developed by Heinz Clem of uh, Germany uh, in 1954. Or at least he published it in 50, no, 53, I think, is when he published it. But he, I believe he actually developed the, the etchants a couple years before. So here's the weld metal, and there's a lot of ferrite in there, and you can see the, the uh, acicular structure that's in there. And here's the base metal. There's cementite right in this area where the arrow is pointing to it, and that cementite is not colored uh, by uh, clams. Now, here's a structure of welded 1020 carbon steel uh, using nitrile on the left, clams number one on the right. And uh, we've got, uh, in the heat effective zone, uh, this linear pattern is real. It doesn't show up actually as well in uh, Clems because it's coloring all the ferrite. And uh, that's due to segregation and deformation. Uh, you can see the overall zone here and uh, the, see these lines. You can only see them with Clems. That's due to, that's due to the segregation and, and the alloy and the pressure during uh, def deformation and the process of uh, welding this. Um, and you can't see that at all over here. The base metal is right on the edge here and over here. And you can see that that's a fine grain equiax looking ferrite. And here's higher mag views at 500x using uh, a, yeah 2% nitol showing the weld metal Lala ferrite and uh, bainite and some fine perlite. And over here in the heat affected zone, we've got a lot of more ferrite that grains visible. And they're fairly equiaxed. Over here in the base metal, we've got ferrite. We've got the dark, dark patches here are perlite. These lighter patches are ba bainite. Hope uh, Harry's here. Yes, Mr. Bainite. And here's a couple color etchants for the weld metal and that area where you can see segregation in, in the um, uh, heat affected zone. That shows up beautifully with color etching, but not always very well with nitol. Th on the left, this is 500x. On the right, this is 100x. Uh, here's a carbon steel with a T-shaped weld and we're etching it with, with clems. The weld metal is on the left here, 
this is the heat affected zone and here is the base metal and, and the, the color etch like this really allows you to well define the, the nature of the ferrite distribution um, and, and, it, and it really works well. If you have more martensite in, the, in a weld, uh, low, higher carbon steels, higher alloy steels, um, I wouldn't probably use Clems. I'd, I'd probably use a, a different etchant, like 10% sodium metabisulfite, perhaps, or one of Braha's sulfamic acid reagents. There's, a, there's several you can choose. Uh, here are higher mag views. This is the base metal, and here's the weld metal. And the color etching really shows the pattern beautifully, and, and you really can and understand what's happening in the weld process much better than anything you do in nitol. And these are both at 50x, so you have more view of this overall structure. Uh, here's another carbon steel weld using clems. And you can see uh, the top edge here. There's a little corner down here. And this is the fusion line. And you can see penetration of this, the metal in this zone into the weld itself. From dissol we're dissolving the steel here. And this is all weld metal over here. Th we're at 50x. And you can see this penetration of the alloy content in the base metal going into the weld. And this, the base structure, original structure, is right here. This is all heat-affected zone. You can see as you move towards the fusion line here, that structure is getting somewhat coarser. Not vastly coarse, but coarser. Now, uh, this example will be followed by the same exact area, but in color. And if this doesn't convince you that color etching is worthwhile, uh, I'm a monkey's uncle. This is a, a montage that I did a number of years ago of when we had Polaroid film. Anybody remember Polaroid? Can anybody here remember actual four by five inch negatives? Yeah, there's a couple of people who are in that ballpark. Uh, but you can see here that this is the base metal. Etched, this is etched with nitol. And I had to stop etching because the weld metal was getting over etched. But the, the, the original steel is not as well etched. But you can see there, this is the base metal. And here we're in the two phase region, but the structure is not showing up very well. But you can see a little bit of hint of acicularity. And this steel was not aluminum killed. And you can see the heat affected zone is start, starting roughly here, uh, where it's above the AC3. The AC1 is going to be over here for the steel, and the AC3 here. And then this is the fusion line over here. And you can see the grains look sort of coarser as you go back uh, towards the left. But look at it now in color. Is that not remarkably better? Isn't that much easier to understand what's going on than the, the nitol? Over here, look at the sharp interface here between the original base metal. Every grain is visible, and it's all equiax. This is the AC1, and this area line here, so to speak, is the AC3 temperature. Above the AC3, we're 100% austenite, right? And in the two-phase region, because it's not aluminum killed, we've got columnar grains. And this is not aluminum killed. I, I know that because I, I, don't, I had the chemical analysis of the heat. And you can see, once we're past the, heat, the uh, AC3, the grain structure is getting coarser and a bit more irregular in shape. And our fusion line is quite easily visible when, in color. And the weld metal is showing up beautifully. That is infinitely better than uh, the original structure in nitol. Now here is a spot weld in a 350 megapascal HSLA high strength low alloy sheet steel. I'm using uh, Braha's sulfamic acid reagent number one. Uh, not long before he died, he was a relative young man when he died in 76. He published four different uh, formula for uh, color etching using sulfamic acid. And they, they do work very well. The fourth one has an addition of ammonium bifluoride, 
and allows you to color etch steels up to about 18% or so chromium. You know, like uh, 440C, Martin uh, Siddick stainless steel, things like that. And I've used it extensively over the years. Now, all you're seeing here is the spot, the, the spot weld only. You're not seeing any base metal nor heat affected zone. But the, the center of the weld is over here. And you can see the flow pattern and of the weld in, as it's solidifying. And uh, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a black and white uh, example of this same etch, uh, same sample in the same area at 50x here like this. Uh, to, to show you, but uh, I can tell you that you can't see that structure anywhere near as well as you can here. This is only a 50x, but uh, it's a beautiful pattern. And we're also viewing that in polarized light and sensitive tint. Many of the color etchants give you good color in bright field. If the color is a little weak, you can go to polarized light and uh, improve the color. If you have a sensitive tint filter, some microscope manufacturers call it by other names, uh, but uh, that, especially if it's variable, you can adjust the color uh, different ways until you, you can see things best. Uh, on the left here, uh, this is a friction butt weld in 439 Fritic stainless steel. We're using uh, the sulfamic acid reagent number four that has the ammonium bifluoride addition so that we can do as a a grade like 439 ferritic stainless, which has a fair uh, uh, chromium content. And you can see in bright field, here's the center of the butt weld, and um, you see the grain structure and how the grains are elongated in the, in the uh, weld metal, or the molten area. And then over here, we're, we're getting to the original structure. And here's the same area viewed in polarized light with the sensitive tint filter. And uh, basically, both are fine. Uh, you can see a, f a little deformation pattern here. You can see it also over here. Uh, you, you know, which one you decide to choose to use in a presentation is strictly up to you. But uh, they're both uh, relatively good. Now, uh, was much, well, previous speaker a little while ago was talking about duplex stainless steels. This is Carpenter's 7MO Plus, which is a typical standard duplex stainless steel. I wouldn't call it a hyper, but 47.5% uh, chrome, 4.85% uh, nickel. You know, you don't want to have enough elements in there that stabilize austenite uh, because then you won't have a duplex structure. The, the idea of duplex stainless steels, uh, they, there was a conference many years ago with people talking about stainless steels. I think, I forget the exact year, but it was around 1980, I believe. And people were talking about how austenitic stainless steels are so wonderful, great properties, great corrosion resistance, except they have this one Achilles heel that they're sensitive to chloride ion stress corrosion cracking. And this is a serious problem with austenitic stainless steels in some environments. And, but on the other hand, you have phritic stainless steels that are totally immune from chloride ion stress corrosion cracking. However, they're not ductile. They're BCC. Face center cubic metals, austenite, are much more ductile. And so somebody said, well, maybe we could marry the two, the, the two phases and get the best of both worlds. Well, I'm, I know Carpenter's first effort to make a duplex stainless steel, they basically used 329 stainless and maybe modified it slightly, but it was 80% ferrite and only 20% austenite. And it, its properties were pathetic because, you know, it make, I mean, it didn't stress corrosion crack, of course, but it wasn't ductile enough. So uh, people have used basically adjustments to the composition of the austenite stabilizing elements to give you a little bit more than 50% ferrite and a little bit less than 50% austenite. That gives the ferrite the continuous path through the structure to prevent chloride ion stress corrosion cracking, but it doesn't destroy the mechanical properties. Uh, the duplex stainless steels have, have pretty decent properties. So this is the original plate steel over here, and you can see 
the, the colored area is austenite, and these uh, lightish, kind of white, yellowish kind of colors, uh, th that's the, the, the ferrite. And so we got stringers of ferrite here, and of course this is the fusion line, this is the weld metal. And uh, you can see that the original uh, ferrite structure in the plate in this zone here, the heat affected zone, has been put in solution and reprecipitated uh, in the grain boundaries. Um, you can see it's all in the grain boundaries here, and then there's particles in some of the grains as well. Um, this was welded with nitronic 50 and we're etching it with a Braha B1 reagent, which is roughly 16% uh, HCl in water with 1% ammonia, uh, um, potassium metabisulfide added to it. And we're using uh, bright field illumination to look at the image, and we're at 50x. Now, here is a, a sample of uh, beryllium. This is a weld in beryllium, you can see a weld uh, nugget up here, and there's a smaller one down here, and a fusion line down the middle, and this is base metal out here. Um, this was polished and taken as polished in polarized light, but without any color uh, technology used either with the film or the uh, uh, using a you can't when you're when you have an alloy like beryllium that is not face center cubic or body center cubic that responds to polarized light like most HCP metals. Um, and if you use straight cross polarized light, you can see the grain structure beautifully. But if you add a sensitive tint filter, generally the image is wiped out. Uh, this was an image done by Richard uh, Buchheit when he was uh, alive, of course and at Battelle uh, Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. Um, he was a great friend of mine. Here's another one that he gave me. This is a uh, flash weld in titanium. And uh, it's nice at, when you're doing this kind of stuff to leave all the, the burrs and things on there uh, because when you, when, you, when you look at them mic microstructurally, they, they add excitement to the image. But of course, you know, in service, you wouldn't want to leave this junk sticking there. Uh, you'd grind that off. But uh, this is etched with uh, an aqueous solution with one and a half milliliters of hydrofluoric acid, 15 nitric, and, uh, and of course, 80 milliliters of water. And it was uh, done by Dick Buchheit also. Um, here's, this is a friction stir weld in 2519 aluminum. And here's the composition here. We're etching this with uh, a color etched developed by Erica Veck. Um, Erica died a few years ago. She had retired, oh, 20, 15, 20 years ago, was living in the Canary Islands when she died. But she developed a, a very nice etch for aluminum and a very nice color etch for titanium also. And here's the mark that the stirring device makes and generating the heat for friction stir welding. And uh, this is the weld metal over here, and this is the heat affected zone uh, after the uh, weld, and we're at 100x. And here's a laser weld in titanium, six aluminum, four vanadium, which is 50% at least of all titanium sold. And uh, you can see the weld metal here, and over here we have the grain structure. And this is uh, Erica Vex, uh, she published uh, the first color etch for titanium was 2% uh, ammonium bifluoride in water. And I tried using that, but it was pretty weak. And then later on, she published uh, the same thing, but with an addition of uh, 50 milliliters of ethanol to it. And when I tried that, I wound up with white spots that were artifacts. And uh, I had a close friend in uh, Krakow, Poland, uh, Janina Radzikuska, who was a, a, a metallographer in the Foundry Research Institute in Krakow. And uh, I sent her an email and told her about this because I knew she worked with titanium castings. And she was a very good color etched metallographer. And she said, oh, yeah, that happened to me too. She said, reduce the water or the ethanol content to 25 milliliters and it won't 
could be that problem. And, and she was right. It really worked well. So that's, uh, her etch is a very good one for titanium to do it in color. And color etching titanium uh, is very useful just like color etching uh, other metals and alloys. So in conclusion, we want to understand the basics of the welding process when we're doing our microscopy work so we can have a better understanding of what we're seeing and why we're seeing it. Um, so you want to sample the weldment to cover the entire heat affected region into the non affected base. So you want to have base metal, heat affected zone, and weld metal uh, to look at. And you want to cut samples, and this is true for all metallography. You want to cut samples causing as little damage as possible because this is where the, the major amount of damage occurs and you've got to get rid of that. And if you're working with titanium, for example, the removal rate of uh, when you're grinding and polishing titanium is much slower than any steel or copper or aluminum or anything else. All the refractory metals have that same issue. And uh, it's, you, you can't, and the problem here is you don't, when you cut something, you don't know what the depth of damage is that you made. And, and when you're grinding, you don't know how much you're removing unless you sit there with a micrometer measuring the, ch the change in thickness as you're grinding. So, you know, and you see, I've uh, seen in the literature in a couple situations, uh, I don't know if any of you do nano hardness testing, very low loads. But in nano hardness testing, in the literature, you'll see more junk uh, data than any other subject I've ever seen. Because people aren't measuring the hardness of the metal, they're measuring the re residual damage left that they didn't remove before doing the, the hardness test. You know, if you're doing Burnell testing with 3,000 kilograms, a little bit of damage on the surface doesn't give you much trouble. But when you're in the nano range, that damage will, will destroy your data. And that is a serious problem. Uh, if you want to look at the edge, you've got to mount the sample. Because if you have an unmounted sample, at, when you press the sample down against the surface, whether it's grinding or polishing, you're going to have a flow uh, with the, the, the material that's rubbing against the sample. And you're going to round off every edge. You're never going to be able to see the true edge and see what structure is there. And if you want to have good edge retention, you have to use the right mounting compound also. And in a few cases, it might be very helpful to electroless nickel plated if it's a sample that can be electroless nickel plated, because not all material can be. So uh, we want to grind the specimen completely flat before we start polishing. And uh, you, you, you know, if you minimize the cutting damage, and I'll, uh, I consult for Struers, a Danish metallography company. I used to work for Bueller for 13 years before that. In the recession, they eliminated my job. I was uh, one of the higher paid employees and 65 years old and out the door you go, you know? Because the CEOs are all Harvard deg MBA degreed people and all that degree teaches is greed, nothing else. So anytime the economy goes down, older people out the door. And they think, oh, I can replace him with or her with anybody uh, right out of school for one third the salary or less. But you know, the area like microscopy and welding is very complex. There's a tremendous amount of technology there, and everything if you're, you're going to do metallography on or everything you're going to weld requires different controls and processes. You know, it's it's not all like making a million bolts of the same size from the same grade. It's quite different. Uh, I prefer to use Naples woven claws uh, or the Allegra, uh, which is a platen, uh, for the pol rough polishing steps with diamond. Now, final polishing, you're going to either use alumina or colloidal silica. They're the two most common, depending on what the alloy is and so forth. And you, but you want to use a cloth that you know you can control the flatness with and the proper load on the, on the cloth or the sample, I mean, against the cloth. And you want to select the best etch to reveal macrostructure or microstructure. 
If you're going to do micro indentation hardness testing in the weld, heat affected zone base metal, that's a great technique to understand what's going on in addition to looking at the microstructure. And I believe that's my last, yeah, that's my last presentation because I, this is a much longer presentation, but I only have so many minutes to speak. And uh, I, the sign says I'm down to two minutes. So uh, uh, at this point, I will stop. Bueno, eh, llegó el momento. Si alguien eh, desea hacer una pregunta, porque estamos con el tiempo un poco justo, eh, es el momento. Bueno, entonces, eh, nuevamente, eh, gracias, George, por tu visita. Gracias por eh, enseñarnos estos, estas eh, excelentes micrografías, ¿no? que han sido el placer de todos. La, micro, la metalurgia a color pues, es una herramienta que... Está, eh, es algo que todavía nos falta estudiar mucho. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Rolando. Eh, ahora tendremos un receso de cinco minutos para emparejarnos con el grupo del otro auditorio. Las personas que deseen ir al otro auditorio también, eh, en este momento eh, van a tener ese tiempo. Entonces, esperamos uh, 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 para cinco minutos para la siguiente lectura. Gracias. You saw that Rolando, you saw a couple of Rolando's pictures, although you didn't know he did them. It was the duplex stainless steel where there was a, a longitudinal plot and then there was a three dimensional uh, planar plot and longitudinal transverse and planar surface in color. And he is one of my disciples. <laughs> color, at, color works. Do you want to sit up?